Good afternoon and a very warm welcome. Welcome back, I should actually say, to this very first panel this afternoon on challenges of implementing an EU-driven legislative agenda in, if I may add, a situation where, in fact, the end goal, the end incentive is missing or rather diffuse. My name is Professor Tobias Schumacher. I'm chairholder of the European Neighborhood Policy Chair at the Natalin campus of the College of Europe in Warsaw, Poland. And I have the pleasure of moderating this debate, this conversation rather, eventually, and then eventually also the ensuing debate that will eventually and hopefully unfold with all of you. Before I will introduce our five speakers, four of who are representing legislatures from two EU member states, from two neighborhood partner countries, and one of who, in fact, is representing a think tank, which is based here in Tbilisi in Georgia. Allow me to also just make a very few remarks to, to some extent at least, set the tone a little bit of this conversation, following, of course, the guidelines that were given to us by the organizers of the conference. In the next, well, 30 to 40 to 50 minutes, depending on how long our speakers will eventually need, we will address and explore in more detail the, say, multifaceted interaction, the relationship between executives and legislatures that is to say, between parliaments and, and governments, uh, governments in this very complex process of implementing an EU-driven reform agenda. This, of course, entails the identification of lessons, of lessons that were learned by countries such as Poland, such as Latvia, that already became members of the European Union. But this also entails lessons learned, so far at least, by countries that are aspiring to become members or a member of the European Union, such as Georgia, a lesson or lessons learned by a country such as Armenia that is currently trying to find its way, trying to position itself in between the European Union and its larger neighbor on the other side of the border. And last but not least, of course, we're also going to have a bit of a think tank um, input. In other words, we try to identify lessons that can be of value when it comes to adopting, implementing, and eventually also enforcing EU rules and regulations for Georgia, but also for Ukraine and Moldova for that matter. When addressing issues related to the many challenges that occur in a situation where a given country is faced with a task to adopt and implement an EU-driven reforms agenda, it is, in my view, important, and I'm very interested to hear our speakers comment on this, it is very important to not just focus on speed and efficiency. Speed and efficiency, of course, are relevant. They are relevant when it comes to keeping the momentum of the process, when it comes to um, quality and quality control, when it comes to contractual obligations, of course. But what is equally important is to anchor this process of approximating with and, and implementing EU rules and regulations in as broad as possible a public support. That is to say, to ensure that you have your society on board when it comes to um, dealing with this particular process. And it is equally important that the executive operates in an integrating, in a consensus-seeking way, reaching out to as many domestic stakeholders as possible. And that, of course, also entails reaching out to opposing voices. And sometimes, as is also the case in this country and other Eastern Partnership countries, even obstructing voices. Obviously, this is necessary. This is necessary for generating and sustaining a high degree of legitimacy for the pursuit of, of a process that 
let's face it, all too often is not just time consuming, but that is costly, that is painful. And it is also important, also in situation where, situations where the composition of government changes, for example, as a result of, of, of elections, that the actual process of adopting, of approximating with, of implementing, and then eventually also enforcing EU rules and regulations is not suddenly being put in question or even reversed. It's about anchoring that very process. So legitimacy and public support here um, are key. And here the executive as well as legislators do play a crucial role. This of course touches upon the issue of uh, the nature of domestic political cultures, if you wish and the respective party systems more generally. And it touches also very strongly on the relationship between government and opposition. And I'm sure our speakers will also allude to this very relationship. Generally, but in particular in a situation that Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine are in. That is to say, in a situation where abiding by a commitment to implement a sophisticated, a demanding, and externally driven and rather intrusive, let's face it, rather intrusive legislative agenda entails a lot of uncertainty, sacrifices, and occasionally even setbacks. It is of the essence that the separation of powers, and this is certainly a lesson that we have learned in past enlargement processes, that the separation of powers between the executive and the legislature is observed and ensured as only that guarantees democratic governance. Put differently, and this is going to be my last point before I will then introduce our speakers. Put differently, in spite of the opposition parties' oversight functions, their relationship with the executive, with the government, should not be competitive and it should certainly not be obstructive, as is all too often the case in highly polarized parliamentary systems, such as, if I may say, um, is also to some extent the case here in Georgia. It has to be collaborative for policy making to unfold smoothly, and this again is also important when it comes to sustaining public support for this very process. And of course, if all of this is being accompanied by institutionalizing um, dialogue mechanisms between the executive and the legislature on one hand and civil society on the other, then of course it is much, much easier, and again this is a lesson that we have learned in past enlargement processes, then of course it is much, much easier for the executive to deal with the challenges or sometimes even negative fallouts that occur in a complex association and integration process. This, just as a kind of teaser, as a bit of an introduction to this very panel, I have now the pleasure of um, introducing and eventually also welcome very warmly our five speakers who are with me this very afternoon. Ladies first, I would like to start with one of our hosts, Ms. Irina Pruitze, who is the first deputy chairwoman of the European Integration Committee of the Georgian Parliament, to which she was elected in October 2016. She is a member of the Council, the Political Council of the Georgian Dream Democratic Party of Georgia. She serves on a number of councils. She is also a full member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. She is a member of the PAC, the PAC, and Euronest. And as I learned, she also is, and I want to mention that, the head of the Georgian Friendship Group with the Parliament of the Kingdom of Spain. Thank you very much for hosting us. It's a pleasure to have you on the panel. The second speaker I would like to introduce is here to my very left, Ms. Lolita Sigan, who traveled all the way from Latvia to Georgia. She is, like Irina, she is also, um, well, in fact, chairperson of the European Affairs Committee of the Latvian Parliament. She has been an MP for seven years, and before she actually has been serving in these very functions, she worked as a political analyst, among others, for the Soros Foundation in Latvia, as well as the Center for Public Policy, Providos. And at some point, you also acted as an election 
monitor or observer. Thank you for being us. Thank you for traveling all the way from Latvia. The third person I would like to introduce to you is Senator Piotr Wach. Dzień dobry. Good afternoon to you as well. It's a pleasure to have you as well. Senator um, Wach is uh, Deputy Chairman of the Science, Education and Sport Committee. He's also a member of the EU and Foreign Affairs Committee of the Polish Senate, where he has been serving for the past 12 years, in fact, already. From 2007 to 2015, he was first Deputy Chairman, then eventually Chairman of the Polish Delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. And in 2015, he served as Vice President of PACE as well. Once again, thank you for being with us. Our fourth speaker didn't have to travel that far, as he basically just came from Yerevan, which is a four hours drive, as most of you know, of course, from Tbilisi. He's a member of the Standing Committee, um, Mr. Miran Hakobian, is a member of the Standing Committee on European Integration of the Armenian Parliament, to which he was elected in April 2017, in fact, so basically just a couple of months ago. He's a member of the Council of the Republican Party. He served as assistant to the Armenian Prime Minister, and prior to entering politics, he worked in Armenian media as both a producer and director. Thank you for being with us, and we also look forward to hear what you have to say in a moment. Last but not least, it's my pleasure to introduce to you a very good friend of mine, in fact, Mr. Vano Chikvidatse, who is representing the Open Society Foundation Georgia, which is based here in Tbilisi. Um, he acts there as the coordinator of the civil society program, working in particular on Georgia's integration, European integration path. Prior to joining the Open Society Foundation, he worked uh, for the IOM mission, the International Organization for Migration. He was with the European Stability Initiative, with the Eurasian Partnership Foundation, and at some point he also worked at the Office for the State Minister of European and Euro-Atlantic Integration here in Georgia. We have plenty of time, in fact, and let us now get started and open the debate, or rather listen to what you have to say before we then eventually open the floor to questions and comments. And I would suggest that we simply stick to the program. So I would give the floor to you, Lolita. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tobias. Um, I have to say first that uh, I am representing here uh, the European Affairs Committee of Latvia, of the Latvian Parliament. And uh, we are a very influential European Affairs Committee, and this I say was a great pride, uh, because uh, our political elite that designed the scrutiny of EU policies uh, on behalf of our Parliament looked at uh, very good examples of uh, our Scandinavian neighbors of how to conduct that scrutiny. And uh, it actually started uh, in the beginning of 90s after we signed our association agreement, which we did already in 95 with the European Union. Uh, basically, there was a decision made that, uh, exactly as you mentioned, uh, to be able to successfully uh, follow through the reforms so that we can get closer to the integration with the European Union, we need a broad support and the Parliament has a very important role to play. So instead of uh, concentrating it uh, in uh, the hands of one executive office, we actually had several branches of power controlling it, but also had a coordination uh, bureau that had an overall uh, oversight and basically that uh, could open the doors and tell people what they were supposed to do if they were not uh, carrying through the plans as it was. Uh, so, and we are very happy that uh, we have this influential role because it helped us to a large extent uh, in the run-up of the EU accession and it is helping us to a great extent today too because uh, our uh, European Affairs Committee, we are actually looking at all government positions uh, before they go to the respective councils where decisions on uh, particular policies are being made in the EU. And we know that actually partly uh, the negativity of the society stems from the fact that in um, 
actually, this, this is a tendency in the older EU member states that uh, parliaments are not sufficiently involved and they feel that there is some kind of a black box that is just completely blinded, blindness to what it is needed. It's just printing laws and regulations and there is some uh, faceless bureaucracy that is just producing these law in, uh, laws in Brussels. Uh, we are very lucky to know that this is not the case and uh, we are very lucky to know that actually we go through a very thorough uh, process of negotiations, of consensus seeking to arrive at particular decisions at the EU level. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, in, in the previous panel, our colleague uh, from the United Kingdom, Madame Moody, you spoke about the communication, the lack of communication. And that is actually true. The EU is very complicated. Uh, for people to understand it, it needs to be uh, explained and explained continuously and explained in the words that only the national parliamentarians can find. Because I believe that our main obligation is to translate the difficult processes of the European Union in the language that can be understood. And actually what I am practicing myself, uh, once in a month I am trying to go and try to talk about the world and also European politics to school children. They have straightforward questions, sometimes quite trying and difficult questions, uh, and I have to respond in the way that they understand and I can relate to young teenagers. And it is very helpful and I think that uh, this is uh, something that uh, we all have to start from. We should not uh, uh, work and start from the premise that everyone knows how good the EU is, what it does, how important it is for our society, and everyone who does not recognize it is just straight out stupid. This is a very, very wrong uh, approach that can really uh, land us in, a, in, in very difficult waters. So in Latvia, we are happy that we had been able to follow this Scandinavian example. Another thing, uh, responding to your question about speed and efficiency, I would actually argue, because I believe that speed matters and efficiency does matter too. And basically, if there are these windows of opportunity, you have to push through the agenda as quickly as you can. And this is one lesson that we learned in Latvia. As I already mentioned, already in 1992, we had our first agreement with the European Union, which uh, kind of uh, showed the way how we will be proceeding. And we signed our association agreement in 95. Very soon after this uh, signing of the association agreement, we had a terrible banking crisis that is familiar to people who come from the West Balkan region. Albania, Serbia, who had this pyramid investment scheme where everything collapsed. People had basically bared to do some savings. They were gullible enough to be tricked and the state did not protect them enough uh, to believe that they will have a huge proceeds. They invested their money and it all collapsed. So we were very happy that this association agreement gave us something to hold on to during these very tough crisis year. Then we recovered and in 1998 there was a economic crisis and devaluation of the Russian ruble, and our economy was very dependent on the exports to Russia. Again, total collapse of our businesses, uh, uh, total collapse of the econo uh, economy. Again, association agreement was something to hold on to. There was a promise to the society that we will be moving towards the European Union, and we had to do it fast. So speed and efficiency do matter. Uh, the last thing that I would like to mention that what played an, an extremely important role for us uh, was our neighbors. Uh, we are a community of the Baltic states. We have a healthy competition among ourselves. We are competing for the, uh, for, for, for the attention, for the investments, but we are also the best of friends. We really genuinely love each other. We share one common history and we were extremely helpful to each other in setting the pace. If one of the Baltic states moved the heads, everyone else felt compelled to catch up and uh, to make sure that we joined the European Union on one date. And that eventually happened in 2004. So we were lucky actually to make sure that our movement towards both NATO and also European Union were already irreversible uh, when 
uh, Russia changed its foreign, po uh, its po foreign policy doctrine and sti started quite clearly defining its sphere of interests. We were already outside it. And we really see, saw that this uh, strategy paid off to a large extent. And similar to that, uh, we suffered a very deep economic crisis in 2009, 2010, but we were able to join the Eurozone in 2014 because we felt that uh, having gone through such a tough economic crisis and almost uh, gone bankrupt, we really needed to pull our act together. And this was, again, very efficient decision-making that was always coordinated between the executive and the parliament. We knew what we wanted. And then, happily, we have matured to the extent that we have already had uh, held our first uh, presidency in the rotating EU Council. That was the first part of 2015. And uh, as they say, now we can say that we are a fully matured European Union member country. And when I look at the Eastern Partnership uh, Declaration, I think there are a lot of tangible things that Eastern partners have to deliver. I'm very happy for our Armenian colleagues uh, because Eastern Partnership actually was very important for them for the eventual signing uh, of uh, the agreements between Armenia and the European Union. It was not exactly the one that was prepared in 2013, but I'm very happy that uh, Armenia has realized that this is a very important piece of uh, agreement uh, that brings it closer uh, to integration with the European Union. And um, we stand ready to support uh, uh, our Eastern partner uh, countries, but uh, the general understanding is there that it's the Eastern partners who have to do the reforms, who have to set pace of the reforms, and also make sure that there is enough push and enough scrutiny from the political parties. And those countries that really have this pro-European consensus in that regard are very lucky because this is a very important uh, prerequisite for really being able to drive that agenda through. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much for this, uh, for this very straightforward um, presentation, and thank you also for keeping with the time. There are a number of takeaways, important takeaways, I think, that you have provided us with. I would just like to single out very briefly, also um, by way of synthesizing, um, three um, that you um, mentioned. To start with a very, one of the very last ones uh, regarding speed and efficiency, I didn't want to deny that speed and efficiency are not important. I just wanted to put them on an equal basis with public support and thus um, the legitimacy issue. But um, for keeping with the, the speed and efficiency um, topic for a second at least, I think you have a very strong point here. Um, on one hand, of course, you could look at, at this entire um, item, so to speak, this topic, from a positive perspective and say, and this applies in particular to the DCFTA stipulations that Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine have in their respective association agreements, the more time you give to approximate with and then eventually implement and also enforce, the better, because it's a complex process. It's a time-consuming process. It's a costly process. The EU Aki Communitaire is ever-evolving. That's the positive interpretation. The negative, of course, is the longer your time frame, the more you are faced with the risk that the executive eventually might procrastinate, that necessary actions, certain reforms are being pushed into the future simply because now is not the right timing, and that that, of course, eventually leads to a situation where you lose public support and thereby your legitimacy to continue with this process even further. So yes, use the window of opportunity. Second takeaway, lack of communication. I think this is a bit of a transversal theme that we have also identified in the very morning. Um, it's an obligation, and I like this point very much that, that, that you pointed out, and I'm very grateful that you stressed it, that it's the obligation of the legislative to translate the all too often very complex technocratic, bureaucratic language that we are faced with in Brussels so that citizens in this country but also other Eastern Partnership countries can actually understand. What is it actually that 
is stipulated in this association agreement. What does this actually mean in Georgian proper? On that note, that reminds me of a recent opinion poll that was conducted by the former IPW in Kiev, according to which 45% of Ukrainians do not really know what this whole association agreement stands for, or put differently, 45% of Ukrainians that were asked in this particular opinion poll would need much more information in order to have an informed opinion. And the third takeaway, again, um, is also a crucial one in particular when it comes to the separation of powers. It is important to not have just one body that monopolizes not just the discourse but also um, the actual pursuit of the process simply because this might eventually, if that were to be ca the case that you had just one actor, namely the executive, that this would eventually um, lead to a situation where it would exclusively dominate the discourse and that in turn could also potentially lead to decreasing public support. So create several branches of power, as you put it, um, and not just leave things to the executive. I leave it on that note and I hand over to you, Senator. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm very glad to meet you this afternoon. Uh, I would clear then in Poland, I am a member of the uh, civic platform, the party who is uh, transferring it to a uh, European level, it is EPP. And uh, so I'm in opposition in, in my country. It's always nice to, I think, and necessary to clear the, this kind of situation. Then I, will, I would refer to something that Lolita said and to her present, presence here because I would like to express appreciation and even admiration to the Baltic states who did these uh, preparations and joining the EU in excellent style and being in very difficult geopolitical situation. Not only you had pro uh, problems, you have problems, in fact, but uh, it was very difficult. And I appreciate, and I would say that we meet uh, with the Baltic uh, states, our parliamentarians regularly. Last time we've been uh, in uh, Lithuania visiting the independence ship, the floating uh, container of the liquid gas, and I also have great admiration that they did such a big effort to be independent to much degree from the big neighbor from the east in uh, delivery of gas. So that's some tribute uh, for our neighbors from the east-north, I would say. Now, as my presentation, in fact, I prepared the presentations uh, in slides, and I took these papers here with me, because I think uh, when I speak according to the, uh, to the program I, uh, uh, I prepared, it's more disciplined, and it will not uh, take s such a long time. It's more, more or less 10 slides. I would like to present you or speak about them now. Uh, it will be very technical uh, because I prepared it thinking about the technology and let's say some characteristics necessary for institutions as well as for the people working in these institutions to make the processes effective and more easy, which is never, never easy way to do. So if somebody finds these remarks interesting, I have also this uh, on pen drive, and I can transmit to anybody who is interested. Uh, it will be about the Polish way uh, to EU integration, which altogether took 13 years from 91 to 2004. We, uh, we, we entered the EU together in this uh, uh, large group of, of, of states. It took the form terms of our parliament, it means the same and Senate, to prepare for accession and with different, four different governments, uh, quite sometimes quite opposite in their political view and history. I would say that first two terms, first two terms from 91 to 97, I would, uh, I would characteristic as 
prevalence of pro-European rhetoric and political declarations. We didn't do much on legislation yet at that time, but there was a time of preparation, preparation society as well as, as politicians and, uh, and, and nice gest gestures from both sides. But still, already in that time, we introduced in our parliament so-called standstill rule uh, for new legislation. So there was a kind of a rule that we do not vote the new legislation, which is in a way against, uh, against the, uh, against the uh, things that uh, EU is, uh, is demanding and, and we have to, uh, to, to follow later that. So it was not worsening the state as it was at the, at the moment, during this uh, beginning time. And the second big period for two terms, it was a rapid legislative advance and intensive domestic debate. Uh, it was more and more, in, uh, 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 let's say, intensive when we were preparing for the, for the referendum to join EU. We had a number of committees during that time uh, dealing with this problem. The first one in the first term was called Committee for European Agreement. And uh, it was 91, 93. They were dealing mainly with association agreement and outcomes of, of that agreement. Then, uh, during the end of this uh, 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 final part of this term and the second term, till 97, uh, it was two terms, the first and the second term of same, uh, there was Committee for European Integration, like it is in most of the countries, uh, ap applying for the membership. Uh, application was in 96. Then we had intensive cooperation with governmental EU Integration Committee, uh, which was uh, settled at the rank of the ministry in 96. Then there was national strategy for EU integration, and this body uh, and this document and these works were required and controlled by same and so Parliament has a lot to do with this important uh, dealings with strategy. And we also have intensive international meetings, dealings, and that was a very important point, to meet and to know uh, uh, all representatives of, of uh, uh, European bodies and to learn from them and to understand what the re uh, really is the spirit and practical demands for us to fulfill. Uh, all the time, the standstill rule on, the, on a new legislation was working until 97. Uh, the next term of our parliament, the third term of same, uh, there was a committee for European integration. That was uh, the name of the committee. Negotiation started in 97. And there was still close cooperation with government. And we were informed, I mean parliament, was closely informed on negotiations by documents and by the chief negotiator. These meetings and these documents were classified. These meetings were closed, so they were not open, but the parliament and the committee was introduced and has something to say about the, uh, the uh, negotiations going on. And in, in 1998, we introduced in our parliament full obligation for harmonization of new voted laws and acts. So starting from 98, everything sh must have been in our, country, in our, in our parliament uh, signed by the, by the committee, studied and signed by the committee that it is in full harmonization. And we also, it is a very, very practical step, we also in, in the year 2000 introduced new regulations of same and Senate procedures and we call it anti-obstruction measures. So the dealings of the parliament was completely free and open, but still we introduced regulations that few, because they were not so many, but few, let's say, very heated and aggressive anti-European, they can't, by only by speaking and taking time, uh, uh, let's say, damage the process. 
So for 2000, we, we, we made some regulations which uh, uh, restricted, let's say, unli unlimiting, uh, uh, let's say, little opposition against the process. I think it is important, and I th think it was not anti-democratic, because you have under to understand, we gained the independence that time in 90. We are at the same time applying and entering the Council of Europe. Uh, so at the beginning, all regulations were completely free because that was a kind of demonstration against the communistic period. So, but practice needed to, to introduce the regulations which make the process in the parliament more efficient. Uh, the, so in, the, uh, in that time, in 97 to 2001, we introduced a second parallel committee, which was called Extraordinary, Extraordinary Committee for European Law, 97 to 01, 2001. Very intensive work. About new 70 new coherence acts were voted. Uh, what is characteristic and maybe important for, uh, for, uh, for countries now entering the, uh, the EU? There was great personalities in the committees, ex-prime ministers. Uh, there was Tadeusz Mazowiecki in that, Józef Oleksy. Quite different, uh, let's say, political options. Uh, one of them, ex-communist. The other one, fighting, ag uh, fighting against communists and the symbol of freedom. But they were, in that way, cooperating. There was very great time, uh, for which now is very difficult, I would say. And uh, practically, excellent organization of operation of, of committees. I have to pay tribute to them. They had about 300 meetings. They had normally three meetings a day. In the morning, first readings. After lunch, there were, after, after the second reading in same. So, amendments. In the evening, international meetings and new initiatives. And it was regular. The, I, I think this work, this kind of work was very effective and good. And practically all harmonization law was passed by same in three readings, not by any decrees. There are some countries which passed some of harmonization law by decrees by government, but uh, the, it was not the case for Poland. And then in the fourth uh, term of, of same, 2001-2005, there was again only one committee for European affairs, that was preparation for membership. A uh, national program of preparation for membership was settled. Uh, this committee worked on 130 projects of harmonization and voted 126 by same. All in three readings, in, in same and also uh, approval or amendments by Senate. I will mention maybe two people connected to this process, one of one of them you can meet on COSAC's meeting very often and European Parliament. It is Secretary of Governmental Integration Committee, Danuta Hibner. Probably you know her. She's a very active lady still. But she was, that was her, her, uh, her work at that time. And chief negotiator for our, for our side was Jan Truszczyński. And, we, and the Parliament also was involved in white information campaign before referendum. For referendum, we did a lot of effort because the only time in Poland we introduced, until now, we introduced two days votings. We are very much afraid about the turnout. And even that there were so many people for entering the EU, our problem was also always and, and still is a low turn, turnout in all kinds of elections. And uh, in referendum, after great effort, and after two days of voting, very special law we, we, we put for that, the turnout was only 58%. With such an effort, it was enough, of course, to be, uh, uh, to be valid. But you can see what well, there was a problem. And the, finally, the fourth term, uh, after entering EU, uh, there was a committee for EU membership, very short, for one year, and it was, uh, it, it, it was, let's say, busy with uh, cooperation with the act which finished this process. It was act on cooperation between same Senate and government according to EU membership. So 
uh, we introduced uh, the law and the, the cooperation between leg legislative bodies and the government is, is based on, 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 this, on, on this legislation. Uh, I will slowly finish, but I will uh, give you my remarks concerning the characteristics of people who should be involved in the process uh, to, be, uh, to speed this process and to make it successful. At first, whoever there is, there is necessary strong national support. That is a base for to do anything. I, I know that you have this, but you have to cherish it because it is very, uh, very important. Then, honest will to cooperate between political forces. It's more difficult for that. Still, it is possible to have influence on that, and it is also important. Then, great personalities. As the, let's say, for chairmanship of committees. It is very important to have authoritative and clever people at chairmanship of, of the committees. Then, personal links between acting institutional bodies. Sometimes, with the regulations that are democratic, it is possible that people link on, on various positions, link different bodies or represent uh, uh, legislative in, in the bodies uh, uh, as, as an observer in other bodies. So it is necessary to build these links very strongly and in a clever way. Then I think it is also very important, favorable parliamentary regulations. They should be just open, but blocking obstruction. I already told you about that. Good good organization of work and, of course, diligence and stamina. Because even if the, if the let's say, surroundings and situation is not very favorable, favorable it is open, it, is, it always happens that there is a short span of time or a window that you can enter. But you have to be very well prepared. And I think you do very good work now talking about that, preparing yourself, because finally, it will be success. And my last slide is thank you and good all preparations and successful. And also very important, but maybe too early, Merry Christmas for all of us and our people. That I wish you. Thank you very much, Senator, for this uh, um, very inspiring um, talk of yours and for reminding us of the Polish experience. I think you touched upon a large number of uh, important, if not to say crucial, points, one of which strikes me to be of particular importance when listening to you, and that is, of course, the um, commitment of Poland at the time, of the parliament back then, successive parliaments, to impose on itself or themselves very strict timetables. Timetables that actually preceded those timetables that were given by the European Union. Um, and that, I think, is certainly a lesson that um, Eastern Partnership countries might want to, well, look into, let's put it that way, a little more diplomatically. Secondly, um, I take note of um, the point that you raised, um, which also picks up on one of the initial remarks that I made regarding putting in place parliamentary regulations um, that basically preclude obstruction from occurring. In other words, these would allow to tame potential spoilers, to spoil the process as such. Um, and to possibly even reverse it. Um, I think that is, that is certainly a point that needs to be looked at, in particular in situations where the political culture is rather polarized, um, as is the case in some Eastern partnership countries. Um, and of course, the point that you stressed regarding public domestic support echoes also what uh, you, Ms. Sigan, have been saying, what I also alluded to at the very beginning, you need to cherish it. I, I fully subscribe to this point. And of course, when it comes to Georgia, Georgia is always being presented as the country that you know, can rely on very stable domestic public support. And to some extent, that actually is true. But you cannot take it for granted. And we have already observed over the last couple of years 
that public support also in this country, which by and large is pro-European and has a European vocation, is eroding. It is not as high as it used to be. The latest figure that I at least could identify was 73% of the public being in favor. But we were already also at some point in the 80s, in the mid-80s, in terms of public support. And we can see what happens when you take public support for granted, when we look at Ukraine, for example, where in fact public support for EU integration is decreasing, and the same, of course, goes for Moldova. So I would like to thank you for raising these, these very important points. And now hand over to you, Ms. Pluitze. The floor is yours. Thank you. I'm very glad that I have provided you such an interesting panel. Uh, when we talk about uh, European reform uh, agenda, uh, we need to ask the question uh, whether these uh, reforms are needed for the uh, European integration of the country or they are important and needed uh, to achieve the truly democratic, economically developed and uh, sustainable country. Here the answer is simple, for me at least. Uh, we all need these reforms because we want our countries to have the same standard of life and democratic institutions as those in European Union. That's why I think that domestic reform agenda is a main objective and not just an instrument for the European integration. Um, Association agreement together with the DCFTA is a good impetus uh, for us to uh, guide us on the challenging uh, road of these reforms. Challenges are everywhere. Challenges are in the parliament, in the government, in society. Um, and um, it's challenge to protect human rights without jeopardizing the security and it's a challenge to find the golden means between fast economic development and social rights. It's also a challenge to ensure proper interaction between different branches of government um, for advancing the reform process and avoiding stagnation because of miscommunication and lack of uh, checks and balances. Uh, we mentioned here uh, competition. You can say that competition is dangerous, but you can also say that competition is good. Georgians like competition. Every Georgian wants to be number one. Uh, so let's consider competition as a mean of ensuring checks and balances. You can compete to succeed, to be the best you can uh, do. Uh, recent constitutional uh, amendments uh, have um, uh, ca carried out in Georgia have clarified the alienation of the power um, and the role of parliament uh, was uh, strengthened even more uh, thanks to these constitutional amendments. Um, how is it connected with the implementation of association agreement and European uh, integration? Uh, Parliament, of course, has tremendous role in this process in implementing uh, the reforms, and this role is binary. One is carrying out and passing the necessary legislative uh, uh, amendments, uh, the leg legislative harmonization, and another is uh, monitoring and uh, oversight of the reforms carried out by the government. So all, both the, those roles are equally important. Uh, we need to f develop the parliamentary instruments such as the committee work, the political group work, and the plenary hearings, and also the public uh, participation, involvement in the uh, processes uh, to address um, uh, this role. Uh, in the uh, Georgian Parliament, uh, European Integration uh, uh, Committee has uh, started already uh, to develop the instruments of coordination between the sectoral committees and the line ministries uh, to uh, speed up the harmonization process. We have uh, also established a very good cooperation with the civil society 
in order to maximize the expertise and um, employment of knowledge and facilitate the healthy multi-stakeholder involvement. And uh, we have started pre-hearing meetings with the civil societies. We organize meetings with them to uh, listen to the, their shadow reports before we go to the meet, uh, hearings uh, of the committees. We have set up thematic hearings with the different uh, sectoral committees. So far during uh, current year, and we have already organized five hearings. Um, uh, one was together with the Environment Protection Committee, uh, where we discussed implementation of the um, association agreement, the environmental part of association agreement, which is quite big. Um, and another was about the uh, Black Sea ecology. Uh, we have also organized a uh, hearing on implementation of DCFTA together with the Sectoral uh, Economy and Economic Policy Committee. Uh, we have organized the hearing on social um, issues with the Committee of Social Affairs and Healthcare. And uh, we had the hearing on implementation of the commitments taken in the framework of li visa liberalization together with the, um, the Committee of Foreign Affairs. But we also realize that this is not enough. We need to work more to develop the group, political group work, uh, in order to strengthen the oversight function of the parliament. The issue was rising here. The opposition's role is also important in these processes. Luckily in Georgia, the main political uh, parties, political groups, support the European integration path of uh, Georgia. We have the uh, unity in this, uh, although we have quite uh, big differences on domestic issues, but on the foreign policy issue, we have quite common uh, view and uh, we have even adopted bipartisan um, resolution uh, at the beginning of this parliamentary term uh, where we um, uh, emphasize the importance of the European integration uh, for the uh, future of Georgia. One more initiative we are working on now is uh, improving content of the explanatory note uh, of the legislative initiatives. Um, together with other important components of the uh, explanatory note, such as the financial justification, we are also working to improve the European integration part of it, the implementation of association agreement, and for that we want to add the table of concordance to the explanatory note, to make it clearer to which EU directives and regulations the particular uh, legislative initiative is answering, and to make it easier for the, uh, uh, the uh, members of parliament, as well as uh, for the staff and civil society to follow the process of um, the harmonization. Um, we are also discussing now very actively the regulatory impact assessment. 80% um, of the uh, legislative initiatives in Georgia are drafted and submitted by the government. Uh, and uh, at the same time, parliament uh, does not have enough capacity and resources to conduct independent regulatory impact assessment for each uh, law. Uh, so uh, we want to develop the capacities in the government to conduct the regulatory impact assessment, but at the same time we need more capacity in the parliament so that we are able to proper, uh, properly check and analyze the RIA submitted by the government together the, with the um, uh, legislative initiative. Um, and uh, besides, uh, with the help of UNDP, we are uh, also working on the action plans of the committee. The action plan uh, of the European Integration Committee is almost finished, and uh, it addresses all the um, uh, legislative um, harmonization processes as well as uh, other uh, um, uh, initiatives that should be uh, carried out during upcoming three years. And uh, what's good that the, the action plans, the process of uh, creating the action plans was coordinated between the committees. So all sectoral committees 
who are responsible to the uh, specific uh, thematic directions, they also have in their action plans separate lines indicating the um, uh, European integration agenda and the association agreement uh, um, commitments. Increased role of the parliament naturally brings about increased responsibility. Responsibility for success as well as failure um, and side effects of difficult reforms. Parliament is main political uh, policy making body of uh, the parliamentary republic and also the executive government is the one who uh, takes care uh, for carrying out the reforms. Parliament is still politically responsible for them. Uh, therefore, uh, Parliament and the Executive should uh, share both the rewards and success and uh, responsibility for difficulties. I'll bring one example. Uh, uh, new law on vehicle technical inspection uh, should start operating uh, in January 2018. This is quite controversial law because um, there is part of society uh, who support it very much because of the environmental and safety considerations. But there is also the poorer stratum of society for whom this uh, law can bring additional financial uh, difficulties. Uh, so it's very important to correctly communicate this uh, reform to the society. And again, here the responsibility of the parliament and the government is equal because the government is carrying out this reform, but the parliament is responsible politically for it. So he, we need the joint liability and uh, good coordination and communication. To finalize, uh, European integration has been firmly embedded as the cornerstone of Georgian foreign and domestic policy. Uh, this is a conscious choice of Georgian people, as you mentioned here, we have very high support, luckily. Uh, more than 70% of uh, the citizens of Georgia support the European integration. Even it's higher than NATO integration, although NATO in, uh, integration support is still quite high. Um, but we understand that this is, we should not take it granted and we need to work on it and uh, strengthen this support. The uh, government of Georgia plans to develop a concrete roadmap outlining well-structured actions to achieve uh, ultimate goal, which is full-fledged membership of the EU. Um, and uh, we all understand and that full and effective implementation of the association agreement and the CFTA um, uh, is one of the key pillars of this process. Thank you and I'm available for your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Pluitze, for this very comprehensive um, presentation of yours. Um, as was the case with the two previous speakers, you also left a very strong imprint, I think, um, on our ensuing debate, um, I believe at least. And I would just like to single out um, one overarching theme that I identified um, in, in your talk, and that is the need to adopt and pursue an integrative approach. And you gave a number of examples in that regard, one of which was the ambition to create greater transparency. You gave the example of making clear which legislative act relates to which association agreement requirement. That, of course, creates greater transparency for decision makers. It creates greater transparency for the public, by and large, to understand the process better. Um, you mentioned also, secondly, the, the fact that, that, as far as Georgia is concerned, you have been having thematic hearings with all sorts of committees, that is to say, all those committees that have been or are concerned, in other words, that there is a very concerted and deliberate and determined attempt on the part of um, the various factions in the parliament to reach out to one another, to, to collaborate across the aisle, um, and thus again 
to ensure that the process as such is not just insulated. Um, you mentioned the term bipartisanship, which I think is a term that needs to be stressed here. And you also alluded to the notion of competition, and I fully agree with you. Um, competition in Parliament is probably what is at the very core um, of any parliamentary democracy. You compete for power and you compete for ideas and opinions, um, and that in turn is a good thing. That is a beneficial thing because it generates different ideas and it also allows majority parties in Parliament to ideally at least absorb ideas of the other and vice versa. Last but not least, a point I would also like to single out that you mentioned in your presentation, um, and that is that democratic reform is not just a tool. It is, it's not just a tool for the implementation of the association agreement stipulations. It has to be intrinsic. And I think that, that needs to be stressed as well, because if it was not, you lose the legitimacy in the process, you lose public support, you lose your electorate eventually, and that in turn means, of course, that the process cannot be sustained over a longer period of time. So I thank you on behalf of our audience as well for these very insightful remarks. Let's go now to our fourth speaker, Mr. Hakobian. The floor is yours. Yep. Uh, I would like uh, to express my, the organizers uh, of this uh, conference my gratitude. Uh, it's great honor for me to participate in this conference and to take part uh, in discussion with colleagues from uh, European Union and uh, countries of uh, Eastern Partnership. Uh, first of all, I would like to mention that Eastern Partnership Brussels Summit uh, is an extremely important event for European region and despite the existing political, geopolitical and economic problems, the summit's results prove that the Eastern Partnership has future. Uh, there is a great uh, unrealized uh, potential uh, and uh, at the same time there is a great desire and opportunities to realize uh, the potential. The Brussels Summit uh, is a historical event for Armenia. We have signed a comprehensive and enhanced partnership agreement with the European Union. And the political and uh, expert society in Armenia have accepted this fact with uh, great enthusiasm. The Armenian-European Union agreement moves the relations to our new level, which is very important for our country. In addition, the declaration of the Brussels summits also has important accents for Armenia. I want to reform some of them. The agreement reaffirms that uh, it's a sovereign right of each part of the country to choose the level and goals of its relations with the European Union. This means that the European Union is ready to deepen and expand uh, its cooperation with Armenia. The declaration adopted in Brussels uh, expressed its support to swift uh, completion of negotiations uh, of common aviation area agreement with Armenia. Uh, so this means that the negotiations uh, have successfully gone forward and now Armenia has approached the signing of the agreement, which is a part of expanding and strengthening the communication links among the Eastern Partnership countries and uh, the European Union countries. Uh, in case of uh, visa liberalization, the Brussels Declaration said, we look forward to strengthen cooperation and further progress in the area of mobility in a secure and uh, well-managed environment and to consider in due course the opening of visa liberalization dialogue with Armenia, provided that conditions for well-managed and secure mobility are, are, are in peace, including uh, are in place including an effective implementation of visa facilitation and the readmission agreements between the parties. I would like to mention that uh, we have repeatedly declared that uh, we are ready for negotiations over visa liberalization and uh, we hope that visa liberalization negotiation will start in the near future and we can sign the agreement uh, in the period of two years. Uh, the declaration gives uh, a general approach to the settlement of conflicts, mentioning the importance of uh, confidence building and peaceful resolution, welcoming to European Union's support to the existing negotiation formats. Uh, within the agreement with the European Union, Armenia, Armenia launches a new stage of uh, sectoral reforms in the system of state government. Now Armenia is in process of final transition to the parliamentary system of government. 
uh, governance. After the constitutional referendum uh, of uh, 2050, Armenia has made the transition from the semi-presidential uh, system to, uh, of governments to a parliamentary system that implies a higher level of democracy. In the first half of uh, next year, the Armenian parliament should discuss and adopt a number of constitutional laws. The role of uh, the parliament in semi-presidential and uh, parliamentary system is quite different, as we know. Uh, the role of parliament increases for the state uh, administration, while uh, at the same time, the role of parliamentary scrutiny increases. Uh, in this case, uh, much work has been done in Armenia. We study the experience of other countries in exercising uh, the rule of law and the scrutiny, the ex uh, executive branch. A few days ago, a parliamentary delegation of Armenia returned from London. I was part of the delegation, and our main mission was uh, to study the issue of parliamentary uh, supervision functions and their possible implementation in our country. Uh, at present, International Center of uh, Human Development is implementing an important project in Armenian Parliament with the uh, support of the British Embassy in Yerevan. Uh, within the framework of this program, we are studying our new role, the new methods and uh, of increasing the parliamentary scrutiny. The Armenian political system is uh, in case that uh, most legislative initiatives come from executive branch, uh, as in Georgia, as I understand, and we think that uh, after the final transition to the parliamentary mo model, the number of parliamentary legislative initiatives will increase. Uh, as for the implementation of the European Union legislation in the Armenian legal system, I should note that Armenia being a member state of Council of Europe and having an agreement with the European Union has been seriously uh, integrated, integrated into the European legal system. Uh, we are one of the leaders in implementing uh, the European Court of Human Rights uh, judicial verdicts. The Armenia has fulfilled every verdict, has paid the compensation, has translated and publicized the verdict, and has included in the textbooks. From the point of view of law development, the European Union legal system is very important for our country, and many laws, many procedures uh, from this space Armenia implements in its legislative field. At the same time, I should be noted, it should be noted that we do not do anything automatically. Uh, Copy-paste is not an uh, effective way. The, the, the laws will not work in not localized, adapted, and adjusted to local traditions. In this regard, I must uh, note that the international commitments and the legal formulations take, taken are every uh, attentionally analyzed and monitored by the Armenian Parliament. When the executive power assumes commitments on behalf of Armenia and bring it to Parliament for ratification, we seriously discuss everything, trying to improve those projects. Uh, on one hand, it is very important for us to be able to fulfill our international obligations, but on the other hand, it's important that these laws work. Uh, in the end of my speech, I would like to once again express my gratitude for organizers and emphasize that after the signing of agreement with the European Union, uh, we are ready to implement its commencements uh, in a short period and full time. We expect uh, long and hard work in terms of legislative reforms and parliamentary scrutiny. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Hakobian, for your presentation, which kicked off by some references to the recent Eastern Partnership um, Summit and, and therefore um, you embedded this in, in, in a sort of Armenian perspective. I take it um, from your presentation that, um, and I, I paraphrase here you, uh, I paraphrase you here that copy-paste is misleading. Um, I think that certainly is a conclusion that applies to each and every partner, Eastern Partnership um, country. Um, each and every legislative act that um, is being discussed in Parliament, that eventually is being adopted and then also implemented and enforced, has to be adjusted, of course, to the very specific 
um, local situation and thus conditions. And in particular, when it comes to that particular point, I'm not entirely sure that there is full awareness of those very specificities um, in Brussels. As all too often, at least this is what I have observed over the years in very different processes, um, there seems to be an understanding underpinning um, certain discourses at least, and to some extent even EU action, um, that what Brussels stipulates, what Brussels imposes, has to be adopted one-on-one. Um, -on -one. And that certainly is misleading, again, also from a legitimacy and public support perspective. I find it very reassuring um, that you confirm to us that the role of the Armenian Parliament is going to increase, that um, the, Europe, uh, the Armenian Parliament is very likely going to um, put forward, initiate many more legislative initiatives than used to be the case in the past, also as a result, of course, of the nature of your political system, as this is of particular importance in the context of implementing um, the SEPA agreement that you mentioned. And by extension, of course, this will eventually, and I take it um, from what you said, also lead to greater oversight functions of the Armenian parliament, um, of the Armenian executive. That certainly is a very reassuring perspective. Let us now come to our fifth speaker. Manu, you have the floor. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to uh, the Parliament of Georgia and the UNDP for putting uh, this uh, conference uh, together. It's my pleasure to, uh, to be here and to uh, share my thoughts uh, with the uh, uh, honorable audience. Uh, I will start my intervention with, I will divide it into several parts. Uh, my first part would be about the advantages that we are having here when it comes to the EU integration. And that it, as it was uh, very correctly mentioned, uh, the biggest adva advantage is this is something which is very much supported by the society. So we have uh, highest support of the EU integration among the EAP countries and uh, even among uh, some of the EU member states. Uh, which uh, actually gives a huge mandate to the, uh, to the uh, executive and legislative uh, branches to push for the, some of the uh, pretty difficult reforms. Uh, the second uh, advantage, as it was also mentioned here, is um, uh, the uh, nonpartisan support of the integration in the uh, parliament. And I just want to uh, remind uh, the resolution which was pa pass passed uh, around one year ago, uh, which was supported by the, uh, by the opposition and uh, Georgian Dream uh, here in the parliament, which uh, sets uh, uh, EU integration and uh, NATO integration of Georgia's uh, foreign policy uh, priority. For, so basically, uh, when it comes to the foreign policy, we don't have uh, much choice, but it's uh, Georgia's eventual membership in NATO and the, um, and the, um, and the European uh, Union. Uh, uh, another, uh, but at the same time, we uh, also see that uh, Georgia is praised being a front-runner country of the Eastern Partnership, uh, which, uh, of course, very nice to hear. But at the same time, it's a, uh, it's kind of you know noblesse oblige that uh, we have to keep that momentum, and we have not be, we should not be satisfied with the progress that we have achieved so far, because at the same time of the progress, we do also see some uh, shortcomings, and I think that this is something is to be uh, addressed in a uh, due way and in a, uh, in a due manner. Uh, when it comes to um, the uh, challenges, and I would not take uh, much of your time here, uh, leaving uh, room for uh, discussion, um, I think that one of the biggest challenges, as it was said here, uh, is uh, that despite the fact that we do see some progress and more activism from the parliament, still the executive branch is kind of, you know, sets the choreography of the, of the uh, EU integration, generally speaking. And I can give you several examples of that. Uh, it was uh, the, uh, the executive branch who was uh, uh, negotiating the association agenda, uh, agreement uh, years ago uh, with very limited, if any, involvement of the Parliament of Georgia. Uh, there was also little involvement in the negotiation of the association agenda uh, and also uh, little involvement in the uh, drafting the association action plan from the uh, parliamentary side. Uh, on the other hand, uh, during the previous parliament, 2012 to 2016, uh, unfortunately, uh, the association agreement and DCFTA party was pretty much abandoned uh, on its own, 
uh, having very limited monitoring on the, on the implementation of it. But on the other hand, we do see that in the current parliament, uh, there is much more activism. We do see the uh, monitoring of the uh, uh, implementation of the association agreement and uh, association uh, agenda pretty much enhanced. Uh, and we do see that uh, uh, the parliament is trying to be more active when it comes to Georgia's uh, EU integration, uh, EU integration uh, policy. But uh, on the other hand, uh, we should remember that uh, we are in the process of approximation of our legislation to that of the European Union. And the huge job is ahead uh, because the part of the legislation that we uh, approximated to that of the European Union legislation is a very tiny part uh, that we have to do. Uh, and in coming years, uh, much more needs to be done. Another challenge is uh, that's a totally new experience for us as a country, uh, implementing the association uh, agreement. This is new experience for the parliament. This is new experience even for us, for the uh, civil society. Uh, and sometimes uh, I do see that uh, there is a uh, lack of capacity in different fields, which is uh, association agreement is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, covering in the civil society as, as well as in the, um, in the parliament of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Georgia. Uh, I think that uh, there are several, uh, several uh, issues here, and uh, I, I want to list uh, when it comes to the future. First is that uh, I think that Parliament has a capacity to be much more involved when it comes to the uh, adopting or uh, revising the foreign policy strategy of Georgia, which uh, starts next year. Uh, and I think that, and I hope that uh, the Parliament would have much more say in that process uh, than it had uh, previously. Uh, then we are now at a very interesting period of uh, drafting the uh, action plan of uh, 2018 of the implementation of the association uh, agreement. And this is something where Parliament uh, could and should have the uh, say in the sectoral parts as well. Uh, and also, uh, we are uh, drafting the uh, deep and comprehensive free trade agreement part of, of the CFTA, uh, the association agreement uh, this year. And I think that the uh, Parliament's role is, is, uh, is, is, is uh, much more bigger there than uh, it's playing now. Uh, and uh, my, my last point would be about the, uh, about the general the EU integration and about the uh, EAP summit. Frankly speaking, uh, the declaration which was adopted uh, there is not something which makes us happy. At least the big part of the civil society is not very happy what we saw there in the document. Uh, this is something very much repetition of the, of the, of the Riga declaration and there is not much uh, new for, uh, for Georgia. Uh, and I think that one of the biggest game changer could be, the, as it was mentioned here during the first panel, uh, the European perspective, because this is something which uh, can be the catalyst of the reforms, and we saw it how it worked in case of uh, visa liberalization action plan. Uh, I just quote the former chair of the EU integration committee, uh, who said that actually any legislation which was coming uh, here, which was linked to the visa liberalization, visa liberalization was kind of password for passing the legislation here. So uh, this is something which I think uh, uh, we should think here, how we should achieve that goal, and uh, we should also try to set our scenario of uh, further integration to the European Union. I'm extremely happy to hear that, as Ms. Pruitt just said, that uh, the uh, Georgian uh, government or the parliament together, they are thinking about the roadmap of, uh, of Georgia's uh, accession since we have the final goal of joining the European Union. I think that as soon it would be sooner, the better uh, we think about how this uh, roadmap should look like and what are the next steps uh, that we have to take, uh, take uh, towards the eventual uh, EU membership. And on behalf of the civil society, uh, I can assure you that we would be more than happy uh, to contribute uh, to that uh, process. So I will stop here and thank you so much and we'll be uh, happy uh, to, to answer your questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mano, for um, this very concise um, talk of yours. One or two takeaways before we then eventually open the floor to collect your questions and comments is that we have to, as much as we like it, um, we have to put this front runner, the good student kind of narrative a little bit into perspective because as justified as it is or may be, um, it all too often um, may lead to situations where the executive, and previously this was the case in Moldova, for example, um, hides itself behind precisely this very narrative and then eventually engages in self-contempt. I'm not saying that this is happening, but there is, of course, a risk um, that this might eventually um, happen. Secondly, 
I'm also grateful to you, Vano, that you stressed the point that this is still a learning process. This is a learning experience, as it was for Latvia and Poland at some point, um, and as it is still for Armenia. Um, and that, of course, implies that mistakes are being made, and it implies also that this is a bit of a trial and error um, to some extent. This is inevitable, um, but precisely because there is this trial and error dynamic, it is of the utmost importance, as you stressed previously, Senator, um, to embed this process in international dynamics, to continue um, dialoguing with other partners, be they in the Eastern Partnership Framework or, in fact, um, in the European Union, as it is all about socialization and social learning and adjusting mind maps and worldviews. Let us now open the floor for questions and comments, and I would like to ask each and everyone that wants to raise his hand or her hand to introduce himself or herself very quickly and to tell us who you address in the panel. Who wants to be first? Everything seems to be very clear. Yes, we have a volunteer in the very front. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, if, if, I, if I need to introduce myself, I am Manet Handelian from Armenia, just for the audience. Uh, my question goes to uh, everyone who will take it or because it is general question. I, I wonder how in your countries and um, which was the, the most difficult reform or legislation to pass through uh, for EU integration? I mean, what was the difficulty and what was the most difficult one to pass if you had such? Thank you. Do we want to collect another one before we go back to the panel? Anyone else, maybe along these lines? Yes, the gentleman in the back. Hello, my name is Mikhail Mirziashvili. I'm from a Center for Democracy and Development. And I have two questions, please. It's, uh, I truly believe that the EU is the best assistant for reforming Eastern Partnership countries to make them democratic and prosperous. And there is a lot to do uh, be such for these countries themselves. Uh, honorable speaker from the uh, Latvia, I think, um, she mentioned that how the Baltic countries help each other to their way to the EU or NATO. And here's my question. Is there anything that the Eastern Partnership countries can do themselves to help each other uh, to be uh, developed uh, on that way, uh, because uh, uh, head of the uh, EU Integration Committee, Ms. Kulordawa, she mentioned she's proud on that, that Georgia is the front runner, uh, and I also, as a uh, Georgian, uh, happy uh, uh, with the result of the Eastern Partnership last summit when Armenia uh, became part of the club uh, of fourth now, who signed the agreement with the EU uh, association agreement. In Armenian case, it's not that uh, particular that because of the absence of the uh, DCFTA, but still. So my question is that, is there anything that the other members uh, of Eastern Partnership can do to push the others to, towards the EU? Um, I hope some days the Azerbaijan and Belarus also will sign this kind of agreement. And second question is that uh, Mr. Janelidze, Minister of Foreign Affairs, mentioned that the 70% of the legislative Harmonization will cover with the EU will cover when association agreement and the CFTA will be implemented. And this, here's the question to, especially to my colleagues from the civil society. So during we are in, in, in the way to implementing the association agreement and the CFTA, do we need any instrument to be closer to the EU or any some special events to make us more? Uh, how we direct to the EU memberships. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's now, let's collect a third one. Yes, please come in. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Kakana Dilaze, representative of the non-government organization Association for Farmers' Rights Defense. First, 
First of all, I really appreciate to be here and it's a little honor for me and for our organization to be represented on this high panel and this discussions. And uh, we are uh, very happy to see how Georgian's agenda is very important for European organizations and for European institutions for um, making Georgian and uh, economy more sustainable more, uh, and our democracy more, more visible, more visible and make, make sure that our uh, uh, policies for the holistic perspective is very important to strengthen our country economy, to strengthen our social and economic justice, rule of law, and make our uh, living uh, social standards much higher and according to Georgian integration processes. And I'm really appreciated we'll be uh, informed about the process and then going uh, uh, stages, on the historical stages of the Poland and Latvia and uh, our the neighbor countries because we are part of this original dimension and from policy perspective we think to make to know more and the more about of uh, make how uh, European uh, part European countries are uh, interested to develop and strengthen the Georgian uh, rural part and part of uh, urban and rural areas. How these reforms was uh, developed in Europe and was, it, for example, in Poland. To uh, I, I mean, social justice and uh, living standards, strengthening our uh, for farmers make more sustainable, more economically profitable uh, in very high competitive uh, environment where Georgia is, uh, is it. So I wanted to know your recommendations how to make uh, rural and uh, living standards much higher for Georgian dimension. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's draw this now to a close and hand over to our panelists. Let me emphasize that we are running out of time, so I would have to ask it to be very brief. Let us start with you, Lolita, as there were two questions, I think, directed to you. Yes. Um, first uh, question was about uh, the most uh, difficult uh, piece of legislation. I can share experience with a particular piece of legislation that I worked with uh, in our uh, time before accession to the European Union because I was civil society activist working with Transparency International and it was implementation of anti-corruption bureau. Mm. Uh, that was one of the core, uh, 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 core demands both from the European Union and NATO uh, for our accession because uh, we were uh, ranked uh, in not a very good place uh, when it comes to the state capture, uh, high political corruption. And it was not easy to push through that law. Uh, and initially, uh, we, we fought uh, uh, very hard uh, for, for pushing it through. And I think in this particular case, civil society played extremely, extremely important role. And uh, similarly, for the whole EU accession, we had the European uh, movement uh, in Latvia, which played an extremely important role for the education of society. So anti-corruption uh, definitely was one that was difficult. And how can you help each other? I think that actually Georgia already helped Ukraine to get the visa-free regime. Because I uh, followed the debate uh, from the EU side, and it was really so that uh, there was a feeling that Georgia was ready, and Ukraine probably not to the same extent. But it was clear that those countries should get the visa-free together, and then you really pulled uh, Ukrainians uh, up, and that's how you helped each other. And I think that you really all should work uh, towards helping Moldova, which does not have uh, as strong political consensus as it uh, did, uh, and uh, your coordination among uh, so-called association agreement countries, mm. I believe, is very helpful, mm. and that definitely helps also Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Belarus. Mm. So you are already helping each other. And it is clear that if it was not for six uh, Eastern partners, there, would not, uh, there wouldn't be summits like uh, big EU partnership summits where, mm. once again, I have to stress that there are 60, uh, uh, 34 countries participating. Mm. It's not just uh, EU plus, but it's uh, a representation from all EU countries. So you are already helping each other immensely. Piotr, very briefly, I'll which was the most difficult? I'll try to, uh, to, 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 to make two sentences. Uh, first, the most difficult reform. In the field of open market competition, it is one field, wide field, and then at the time we are entering, uh, we are applying, it was LGBT people 
and uh, in, in the field of human rights. Mm. We were not ready at that moment, and that was a problem. Then how, how to best assist uh, Eastern partnership countries? I, I see two ways from my point of view. First, advocate for you as much as possible in a, let's say, clever way. And then the second one, more difficult for me, behave ourselves correctly. Yeah. Not all EU members are behaving in the, in the sense that are, are encouraging, let's say, uh, uh, the EU to, for arrangement. There were resolutions uh, uh, about some countries, I will not mention which one, which ones, because I think two. And one thing is to give a good example, then it is open for the others. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Irina, just briefly. Uh, well, if you ask about the most difficult uh, law, definitely so far it has been anti-discrimination law because there was mm. high level of resistance from the conservative part of society, and Georgia is a quite conservative country uh, with orthodox, very strong Orthodox Christian church. So the, this process, which uh, this law was adopted in the framework of uh, LibVillap with a liberalization ex action plan, and the process was quite difficult. But uh, thanks to good coordination and communication with the uh, Orthodox Church with different layers of society, we managed to pass this law. Um, another example which we are working now, our committee is going to initiate, is the consumer's uh, rights, a law on the consumer's rights. It can be also quite difficult because here we have the uh, interaction of the economic development, the uh, development of the businesses, and the consumer's rights. Mm. And of course, Georgia still has to do a lot in terms of economic development, and we, here we need to find something, you know, golden mean where uh, from one side the um, interests of the businesses are not too much um, diminished, and at the same time we manage to have a good consumer's law. And uh, there was also a question about the instruments uh, to be closer to EU. And as I already mentioned, we have the government uh, working on the uh, roadmap uh, for EU membership. And uh, it means that we need to start the, uh, scrutinizing uh, our le legislation uh, similar as the candidate uh, countries are uh, doing. Uh, and this will be the new additional instrument for us to mm. get ready for the uh, membership um, uh, application, uh, no matter when the kind, time comes for this. Thank you. Mihan, and one or two sentences each. Maybe, Mihan, on... Briefly, just, one, to, just to answer my one, colleagues. One, 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 oh, sorry. For interrupting you. Mihan, sorry. maybe a sentence or two and on how Eastern Partnership countries can help one another? Uh, we understand in Armenia that uh, reforms we are doing uh, for ourselves, and uh, uh, we wait for our European colleagues uh, to help us uh, by these reforms. But we know that uh, reforms we are doing to ourselves, it's very important. And uh, it, there is, in Armenia, we have a great enthusiasm in expert and uh, political society in case of uh, disagreement. And I think uh, we have uh, less time for good work and uh, for reforms in government system. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Ivano. Yes, very briefly. Uh, just to, uh, to, to answer the question, uh, I think that we do, do need the uh, perspective, and I can tell you why. Uh, because the last uh, regulation that we have to approximate, if we continue this uh, association agreement approximation process and just look at it, the date is 2029. It's about the climate change. So, uh, and we know the great experience of visa liberalization action plan. It was mentioned here, the anti-discrimination law. And uh, personally, I don't believe that the parliament would ever dare to pass that law back uh, years ago. Uh, if not the requirement of the visa liberalization action plan, because it was, it was something which will act as a catalyst. Uh, and this is not only one. There, is, there was also the labor inspectorates, which was, if you look, the progress report of the ENP. It, Georgia was always criticized of the labor rights. I mean, the, you know, not having the proper labor safety, et cetera, et cetera. And then we introduced this uh, labor inspectorates, uh, which is not great, I mean, in terms of the quality, but, but still. 
Uh, there was also the case of uh, migration uh, profile that uh, you was asking us to adopt, and then we did it only after we got the, it as a requirement of the visa liberalization action plan. So I think that this is something which uh, acts as a catalyst. And, and last but not least, having the membership perspective and being a candidate country also opens the opportunity for the additional financial resources. Uh, nowadays, we get something like 100 uh, million euro per year from the European Union in order to push for these uh, reforms. And these reforms are increasing, as I already said, and it needs much more financial support. So it would also help us to attract much more money in order to, 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 to deliver uh, on our promises. Thank you very much, Vano. We have come to the very end of this panel. Being German, I was initially thinking that I should apply a rather strict time management regime, living up to our alleged or presumptive reputation of being strict. I fail terribly, but I don't think this is a problem given the very insightful and rather interesting and important presentations and insights that uh, our speakers shared. I would like to ask all of you to join me in giving our speakers a very warm round of applause.